There is nothing exempt from the peril of mutation. The earth, heavens, and the whole world is thereunto subject. And thus is the case in tonight's story. It's once again time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. How the hell did they compromise the safe house? Jug's deep voice rang out in the silence of the makeshift refuge held within an old and abandoned electronics factory. His scarred and battered face contorted into a look of utter disbelief. Safe house Echo was one of our most secure, and they tore through us like it was nothing, he continued, as Doc began to stitch up the gash in Jug's right arm. Hold still. And keep your voice down, she said, pushing a lock of golden blonde hair from her face. Do you want a repeat of last time, Johnny? She quipped. Jug laughed quietly, remembering the last time she accidentally stabbed him in the side of the head while patching up a cut across his face. The laugh echoed across the room before gently fading out, leaving the six of them alone in the silence once again. After what felt like a lifetime, a voice finally broke the deafening silence. Clocksmith, have a look around the factory. You may be able to find a few things that will come in handy for later. Snipes, find a vantage point on the roof and radio down if you see anything suspicious. Clocksmith nodded and quickly turned away, clicking the button on his flashlight, though it remained dark. He aimed it towards himself and gave it a few smacks before the light finally flickered to life, illuminating his old and worn face. A face aged in such a way that only war can cause. He began to walk into the darkness as Snipes grabbed a rifle. Don't shoot first, Snipes. We need to be able to slip away quietly, if possible. She turned and faced the man, the faint moonlight coming through the broken windows, lightly bathing her bright red hair. You got it. Specs, safety on, she said before flashing a smile and walking to the nearest ladder that led to the roof of their new shelter. Specs turned away and quietly made his way over to a decrepit wooden table. He unhooked the small electric lantern from his side and placed it on the corner before putting it on, the light reflecting off of the now cracked glasses that sit on a face that reveals his old age. He removed a torn mat from his satchel and proceeded to spread it out onto the table. As he began studying the hand-drawn roots, Jug came from behind him and stood next to him. Any ideas on where we're headed, boss? Spex looked up at him and studied his face, a youthful yet battered one. He noticed a faint and hopeful smile across the young man's dark face before returning to the map. I'm thinking, safe house Charlie. But that's ten miles out. Bravo is less secure, but it's only a four-mile hike. We still don't know the severity of the situation, so there's a chance we won't be able to make it ten miles. Jug took a step forward and took a look at the map. And if it's truly as bad as we think, a less secure safe house is at risk of being under siege, even if it's closer, he remarked. <sighs> exactly, Spex replied letting out a defeated sigh. The two took to thinking quietly about how to proceed, when another man broke the silence. So, we really only have two options here. Safe House Bravo, which is closer yet not very secure, and Safe House Charlie, which is secure but further out. It's about... The man looked down at his watch, pushing his black hair from his eyes. 2337. If we were to head for Charlie, daybreak would hit before we made it three quarters of the way, whereas if we went for Bravo, we could make it with time to spare. The available routes are also less guarded and it's easier to move through while staying out of sight. Going towards Charlie would result in having to go through the Central Park, which is more than likely going to be guarded by Arax 4 Division. The silence returned, remained for a few more minutes before it was broken by the hiss of a radio. Come in, Spex. The voice crackled over the radio, sitting atop a small pile of junk. Spex made his way over and grabbed it and responded. What's going on, Snipes? K-1 
Koenig's unit is moving in from the west. We don't have long before they get here. Maybe 30 minutes. Spex paused for a moment before responding. Okay, get back down here. We'll start packing up and getting ready to head out. Copy that, she replied. All right, grab Clocksmith and help him with whatever he managed to find. Doc, Jug, you two gear up and get ready to head out. Snipes and I will cover the rest. The three of them immediately got to work as Specs folded up the map and placed it into the satchel at his side. After a couple of minutes, the clangs of boots on the rungs of a ladder indicated Snipes' return. She hopped down and gathered her things, Albright and Clocksmith returning at the same time. Find anything good, Clocks? Snipes said, somewhat cheerfully. A few things. Should be useful if we end up in a sticky situation. How's that laser rifle holding up, Doc? No more mishaps? He said, turning to Doc. All good ever since the last service, she responded. Good. We're probably going to need it, he said sternly. What's the plan thus far? Snipes asked, turning to Specs, a hint of anxiety in her voice. Koenig's unit is closing fast, and they'll be able to pick up our scent and track us down if their handlers realize that we're here. Specs responded as he finished gathering his things, doing his best to maintain the image of a cool and collected leader in the face of an all-too-bad situation. We're heading for Safe House Bravo. Less secure, but we should make it there before daybreak. With any luck, they haven't been discovered yet. The anxious look on Snipes' face increased for a brief moment before she regained her composure. Sounds like our best bet. Let's get moving. Ready to roll, Jug? She asked, turning to Johnny. Yeah, as ready as I'll ever be, he responded with a smile on his face. Good, Speck said with a strong sense of determination ringing in his voice. Let's move. The six-person team known as Alpha Squadron One quickly left the factory under the cover of darkness, the moon being their only guiding light. They swiftly made their way towards Safe House Bravo, moving from building to building, using a smaller map of the route made by their squad leader, Specs. The first quarter of their journey went smoothly, and according to plan, until the squad came across a police checkpoint blocking their path. Just our luck that Arax 3 would set up a checkpoint along the path, Snipes remarked, a hint of agitation in her otherwise soft voice. How do you know it's the Arax 3? Wouldn't it make more sense for Arax 2 to set up in this part of town? asked Jug. There, look, Snipes replied, pointing out of the shattered window towards the rooftop of a building about 30 meters away. That's an Arax patroller, trademark unit in use by Arax Divisions 3 and 4. I know it's 3 due to the older age. She finished. Okay, but why sit up here? Clocksmith inquired. Oh, this isn't a city hotspot for SOTO activity, so why deploy an advanced unit? Safe house airco. Specs responded, studying the Arax patroller as it descended its rooftop perch. They're here to search for survivors making their way to other Sotu safe houses. We need to be careful, he said warily. Specs retrieved the small map of the Echo Bravo route and turned his back to the window, letting the moonlight illuminate it. After examining the map for a short while, he spoke again. We'll have to reroute. With the checkpoint blocking our path and patrollers actively searching for survivors, we need to diverge a fair bit, but not too much. We can't afford to lose too much time. It'll be risky, but we don't have any other options. He finished. What about the sewers? Albright asked. If I'm not mistaken, it'll be a further hike, but we'll be off the streets and it'll... And, well, it'll eventually lead straight to Safe House Bravo. Not a good idea. The regime dropped a basilisk in there a few months back. Figured that out the hard way when Bravo 4 was nearly wiped out down there a few weeks ago. Doc responded. Shit. That's what happened to Bravo 4? Jug asked, dumbfounded. When did they manage to make those? I thought genetically modifying snakes was proving too difficult for them. Enough. Spex spoke up in a whispered shout. We need to move. We can't be found here with our thumbs up our asses when a patroller comes by. With that, Alpha One moved out again, 
this time on their redirected course around the Arax 3 division checkpoint. After making it nearly the entire way around the checkpoint, Snipes stopped the squad in an alleyway after hearing a faint chattering nearby. Did you guys hear that? She said in an almost inaudible whisper. The squad stopped and listened intently. Their looks of confusion quickly turning to fear, save for Specs, who maintained his stark composure. They remained motionless with bated breath until the source of the chattering became apparent. Out in the street adjacent to the alley they were in, an old Arax patroller scuttled into view. The creature stood about five feet tall with black hair, long spindly legs and massive mandibles. It stopped and stood still, slowly looking around and intently listening for any disturbances. Specs looked back at his squad and motioned for them to quietly move forwards down the alley and out of sight of the arachnid. The squad began to move forward at an agonizingly slow crawl. Specs, Clocksmith and Doc managed to make it through the clearing and out of sight of the patroller. But just as Albright was about to make it to relative safety, a faint clang rang out in the silence as Snipes felt a small can brush against her foot. The arachnid quickly swung around and faced the alley, looking directly at Albright, Snipes, and Chuck. Everyone momentarily stopped, and the three in the clearing fixed their gaze on the patroller, looks of terror on their faces. Oh, shit, Jugs managed to say before the patroller quickly charged. The three of them broke from their stupor as Speck shouted, Run! The squad broke into a sprint down the alleyway, hoping to make it to the building at the end before the patroller managed to catch up to them. As the six of them ran, Jog swung around and aimed his weapon at the beast, an eight-gauge shotgun loaded with double-aid buckshoot. He quickly fired three shots at the creature, two of them hitting under its head and another hitting its face. The arachnid let out a pain screech before turning to run up the wall of one of the buildings. Jog let off another two shots at the retreating patroller before turning back to continue running. Thanks to his youth and strength, he quickly caught back up with the squad despite his heavy gear. As the squad made it about ten meters away from their safe haven, the patroller returned, dropping down directly in front of the doorway to the building, blocking their way forward. They all stopped suddenly, Jug nearly barreling into Snipes in the process. The arachnid stood still, seemingly blinded, with disgusting green ooze leaking from the gunshot wounds that Jug managed to make. Speck stood still at the head of the squad with a strong and determined look on his old, war-torn face. He slowly removed his glasses and whispered, Albright, C4 charge, now! Albright reached into his backpack, retrieving a small charge as he stepped forward. He handed the charge to Spex, as Spex handed him his glasses and satchel. Once I'm done, as fast as you can, you need to make it as far away from the checkpoint as you can before the rest of them show up, he said in a stoic tone. Moss, Chuck said quietly, just do as I say and run. This thing will rip us to shreds before we can take it down with conventional weapons, and that launcher on your back will hurt everyone in a tight space like this. He then looked to Clocksmith before speaking again. You're in charge now, Richard. Get to safe house Bravo at any cost. Get these guys to safety. Clocksmith nodded solemnly as Specs turned forward. You don't have to do this, Tim, Doc shouted, trying to move forward, but Jug held her back. It's okay, Sarah, he said to her softly as tears began to well up in her eyes. The sudden noise caused the arachnid to charge again, heading straight for the squad. Spex, in turn, also began to sprint forwards, C4 in hand. Jug used his body to shield Doc and the others turned and covered their heads as the pair met in the dark and dank alleyway. Just as Spex came into range of the beast, he flipped a switch on the charge and an explosion erupted, consuming the pair. The loud boom left a ringing in their ears and disoriented them a bit. As they regained their senses, they all stood in unison and faced the aftermath mess of blood, green ooze, and gore. They all stood in disbelief for a moment, before Clocksmith spoke up. We need to move, quickly, now! 
The remaining five squad members moved forwards, slowly at first as they made their way past the grisly sight. Once they made it beyond the threshold of the building, they began to move with a fast pace once again. After covering another mile without attracting the attention of another patrol, they found another building to take shelter in for a moment before continuing on. Albright took the time to hand the satchel containing the maps and specs glasses to Clocksmith. Thank you, Alfred, he said softly as he strung the satchel over his shoulder. The five members of Alpha One all sat down in silence as they reflected on the recent events of that dreadful night. Jug was the first to break the silence, still looking blankly at the floor beneath him. It was Tim that got me into the Sons of the Union, you know, he said with a strong hint of sadness in his voice. You know, the streets aren't too kind to an orphan black kid. I was running on borrowed time when he found me and took me in. He, he was like a father to me, he finished. And a proud father he was, Johnny, Doc said as she slid closer to him, putting her arm around him and her head on his shoulder. The silence returned for a few minutes before Clocksmith spoke up. Tim was a good soldier. Good man. He always stood up for what he believed in, no matter the personal consequence. He was one of the first to join up with Sotu when the Second Civil War broke out. He saw the entire war and its aftermath. Yet he always pushed forward. He always kept fighting for what he knew was right. Well, here's to Tim, Speck Simmons. Father, soldier, and a damn good man, said Albright. Here, here, the others responded together. As they finished and the quiet returned, a faint sound could be heard in the distance. Are those gunshots? Snipe said in a hushed tone. They all listened intently and could certainly make out the faint sound of gunshots ringing out in the distance. Oh, we need to move out and see what's going on. It sounds like those shots are coming from the direction of the market, Clocksmith said as he quickly rose to his feet, the others following suit. Within seconds, the squad was ready to move out again and swiftly moved towards the source of the commotion. The squad moved with haste as the sounds of fighting grew louder. After travelling another half mile beyond the resting place of their recently deceased squad leader, half one came to the site of an old apartment complex typically inhabited by the individuals that run the black market within, as well as the occasional Sons of the Union squads looking for a place to rest and restock. As they made their way to the central courtyard, the source of the fighting was revealed. There was a large conflict underway, with shots going off everywhere as a large group of men, some being Sotu squad members and others being the inhabitants of the complex, fought against the Mantix II siege division. Alpha One quickly mobilized to join in on the fighting. Snipes entered the building and made her way up to a vantage point as Jug and Doc flanked left while Clocksmith and Albright flanked right. Jug slung his shotgun over his shoulder as he pulled an M72 LAW off of his back. He knelt down and took aim at the nearest mantis. After shouting, Back blast! Area clear! He fired the rocket at the monster. The projectile quickly travelled to and hit its mark in the chest area, the explosion tearing a large hole where it hit. The mantis stumbled before falling over, dead. Jug returned the launcher to his back before retrieving his M240 Bravo and running to where the fighting was fiercest, Doc in tow behind with her laser rifle in hand. The two ran into battle, Jug unleashing a hellstorm of bullets as Doc carefully took shots at the enemy with her MX-92 laser rifle. Meanwhile, Clocksmith worked his way around to the other side of the courtyard, joining up with several men firing at mantises as Albright hung back for a moment at the courtyard entrance. After a few minutes, Albright joined in and began to fire shots with his M-16 as Clocksmith continued to take shots with his M-14, one so modified that it hardly resembled the original design. The Mantix II Division continued to tear the men to shreds, killing them far faster than the men were able to fell the beasts. As Clocksmith and Albright continued firing, one of the Mantises turned towards them and began to make its way to them. The bullets seemingly have no effect as it charged. Richard, did you finish that little grenade experiment of yours? Albright asked quickly. I mean, yeah, but I don't know if they'll work, 
he responded. Give them here, Albright curtly said. Clocksmith obliged and reached into his pack and retrieved two orbs, each with a knob on them. Albright turned the knobs on each of the grenades and threw them at the beast. They landed on the ground just under the rushing mantis, and as they did, they erupted into a massive electrical blast that consumed the foe. Once the intense blue light had died down, it revealed a charred and smoking mantis. Its legs gave out from beneath it, and it collapsed to the ground. Albright looked over to Clocksmith with a wry smile, to find that he had a look of pleased accomplishment on his face. With the obstruction dead, the men, Albright and Clocksmith included, made their way towards the centre of the courtyard, where the two last mantises remained. The men encircled the beasts, firing as they drew closer, the combined fire of them managing to affect the mantises. The creatures, upon realising they'd been boxed in, began to become frantic. The men didn't relent and continued to fire upon them with a storm of bullets. Suddenly, the beast charged in a single direction in an attempt to escape. The men in the path of their charge attempted to jump out of the way, but many were swiped at and trampled by the stampeding mantises as they made their escape. Everyone continued firing them as they made their escape towards the main entrance to the courtyard. As they crossed under the archway, Albright removed a switch from his pocket and flipped it, causing an explosion to consume the fleeing enemies. When the smoke had dissipated, nothing but a mess of gore was left where the two mantises were. <sighs> Not going to get away that easily, Albright said as he stuffed the switch back into his pocket. With the battle won, the remaining fighters began to tend to the wounded and collect the dead for burial. Albright and Clocksmith began to search for Doc and Jug as Snipes rejoined them. Where's Doc and Jug? she asked. I lost sight of them in the commotion. Yeah, we should check where their wounded are. Doc would be helping there. Jug would be helping the others collect the dead and wounded, Clocksmith said. The trio made their way to where the wounded were being treated, but had to walk past the row of dead as they made their way. As they walked past, Snipes suddenly stopped, causing Albright to run into her. What the hell, Snipe? he said. His words cut short as he noticed the look on Snipes' face. Clocksmith turned around to see the colour had completely drained from it. The two men then turned and looked at what she was staring at, to find that the bodies of Jug and Doc were laid amongst the dead. Doc had a deep gash across her chest, and Jug had a large hole punched straight through his. The three of them looked down upon their fallen friends, a feeling of deep sorrow overcoming all of them. Sarah, Johnny, Smipes mumbled as tears streamed down her dirty face. Albright put his arm around her and pulled her clothes. She buried her face in his chest and began to weep. Clocksmith continued to stare on at the bodies of Jug and Doc in sorrow and disbelief. The moment was interrupted by a man with a thick Arabic accent as he approached them from behind. Fellow squadmates, he asked calmly. Albright nodded lightly, and Clocksmith responded. Yeah, some of the best I've ever had the honor of fighting with. He turned to the man and was met by a young individual with light brown skin, a thick black beard, and long black hair pulled into a ponytail. My name is Yusef, Yusef Hajar, he said extending a hand, though my squadmates call me Blade. Clocksmith took the man's hand and replied, Richard Godfrey, codename Clocksmith. The look on the man's face turned to astonishment. Wait, you're the Clocksmith of Alpha One Squadron? Clocksmith nodded lightly as he returned his hand to his side. Yeah, that'd be me, he said emotionlessly, as he returned his gaze to the bodies of the fallen. What squadron are you assigned to, Blade? The man stepped forward and stood next to Clocksmith and also looked down upon Jug and Doc. Delta Six, a squad that specializes in hand-to-hand -hand and stealth combat. We were on our way to reinforce Safe House Echo, but we were too late. The siege was already well underway. We radioed in to HQ and they advised that we divert to Safe House Bravo. 
We weren't sure that anybody made it out alive. Clocksmith lightly sighed before responding. Oh, all of Alpha One made it out alive. We decided to make our way to Safe House Bravo. But we lost our squad leader, Spex, on the way here. Now Jug and Doc are gone too, he said, his voice dropping off at the end. Ah, oh, the death of a friend is never easy. We've all seen far too much of it. Too much fighting, too much death and destruction, but at the end of the day, that's exactly why we fight. Why we put our lives on the line. For the hope of a better future. They died fighting for that future, Clocksmith. Hold that fact close to your heart, Blade said as he put a hand on Clocksmith's shoulder. There was a moment of silence, and then Clocksmith spoke. So, uh, you're heading to Safe House Bravo, right? Yes, indeed we are, Blade responded. Do you have your full squadron with you? Clocksmith asked. Blade sighed and replied. There are only three of us left. Lenny, Mike, and Elias all fell here defending the market. They were our medic, explosive specialist, and spotter, respectively. I'm the squad leader. My sister Samira is our second spotter, and Ivan is our weaponsmith. You have three remaining as well, correct? Correct. I've been the leader since Specsville. Doc and Jug here were our medic and heavy weapon specialist. Albright is our explosive specialist, and Snipes is our long-range specialist, he said, turning away from the bodies. Well, we should team up and move onward to Bravo. We'd have a better chance of making it if our squads came together. Blade nodded and smiled. Come with me. I'll introduce you to Ivan and Samira, Blade said. And with that, the four of them walked across the courtyard and came up to a man and a woman having an animated conversation. And that is why it will simply not work, the man said in a very light Russian accent. It just isn't possible. Well, not with that attitude, Blacksmith, the woman responded with an Arabic accent equal to Blades. Anything is possible with the right attitude. She continued with a smile before turning to meet the approaching group. Footpath, Blacksmith, I'd like you to meet Clocksmith, Albright, and Snipes. They're the remaining soldiers of Alpha One, and they'll be joining us on our way to Safe House Bravo, said Blade. Alpha One, you say? Blacksmith replied. I never thought I'd have the honor of meeting a special forces squadron. Or what's left of it? Clocksmith responded, extending his hand. So, you're the famed Clocksmith, Footbath said, a look of surprise painted across her face. Could you please tell this oaf of man that it is indeed possible to create a viable flaming sword? She asked, casting a sideways glance at Blacksmith, who responded with an eye roll. Uh, I mean, it's certainly possible, if not difficult. Your main issue would be a lightweight and official fuel source, but if you use... Please, do not encourage her, Blacksmith interrupted. Okay, okay, Blade jumped in, stopping the conversation. We need to leave soon. Alpha 5, Echo 3 and Delta 3 are here and will help in securing the market. Start gathering your things. We need to leave in the next ten minutes. Daybreak is in an hour and we still have a mile and a half to cover from here. With that, the newly joined squadrons prepared to depart once again to cover the last stretch, to make it to Safe House Bravo. The joint squad left the market complex after gathering their things and saying their final farewells to their fallen friends, embarking on the last mile and a half stretch before they at last reached Safe House Bravo. With half of Alpha One fallen, the remaining soldiers continued on in grim silence and determination hoping against hope that their journey wouldn't be in vain. Considering the fact that Safe House Echo, one of the most secure, was compromised and destroyed, there wasn't a good chance that Bravo would be left standing by morning if it too had been compromised. This was the thought process of those in Alpha One. However, the remaining members of Delta Six had higher spirits and hopes. Between the playful bickering of Blacksmith and Footpad, as well as the calm confidence of Blade, the group was able to move forward at a steady pace, covering a mile over the course of twenty minutes. With only a half mile left in the awful four-mile trip from the smoking ruins of Safe House Echo, 
The sound broke the silence that had fallen over the group as they came to the end of their journey. An explosion. What the fuck was that? Blacksmith remarked. An explosion, Albright responded. Then we need to move faster, Blade said, looking to Clocksmith, who nodded in agreement. The six of them began to run for the final half mile, the sounds of gunfire and explosions ripping through the air constantly as they closed the distance. As they approached Safe House Bravo, the smell of sulfur and blood hit their sense of smell, and the yells and screams of men and beasts assaulted their ears with the sound of gunfire. They cleared their way from the buildings to the street, and as they set foot on the asphalt, they looked forward to see Safe House Bravo in flames. In front of the burning Safe House, a large fight continued, but was far worse than what had happened at the market. This was almost as bad as the conflict at Safe House Echo. The six remaining soldiers of Alpha-1 and Delta-6 immediately sprang into action, ignoring the insurmountable odds. Snipes again took to a rooftop to gain a vantage point, while Blade and Footpad charged in together. Clocksmith, Albright and Blacksmith all held back for a brief moment to observe the situation. This is really bad, Blacksmith said, noting the sheer number of enemies. There were men and beasts alike assaulting the safe house, from several police divisions of the regime. From the outskirts of the battlefield on her rooftop perch, Snipes could see just how diverse the attacking force was. With a quick glance, she noticed two Canix divisions, three Arax divisions, a Mantix division, as well as the dreaded Sphinx division. Foul beasts created from spliced DNA of humans and lions. Snipes quickly began to take aim at the human enemies as the others down below charged in. Footpad and Blade worked together using the all-too-rare laser swords that they had acquired years back to run through the battlefield and cut their enemies down. As they made their way through, they eventually came across a large mantis. Footpad gained the beast's attention and quickly dodged a swipe as Blade ran around and removed two of the creature's legs with two swipes of his sword. This caused the mantis to stumble forward, putting its head within striking distance of Footpad, who delivered a decisive blow that removed the beast's head. Meanwhile, as Blade and Footpad cut their way through the battlefield, Albright, Clocksmith and Blacksmith charged in, using a few creations of the two weaponsmiths. Clocksmith removed the final two experimental electrical grenades and tossed one to Albright. The pair turned the knobs on the grenades and threw them at a nearby canine that was ruthlessly tearing apart the poor individual that was unfortunate enough to be caught unawares. The two grenades landed beside the monstrosity, one of them detonating, but the other failing to explode. Nevertheless, the blast from the functioning grenade crippled the beast and left it disoriented. Blacksmith took the opportunity to rush in with a unique battle axe that he had fashioned. As he approached, he reared his weapon back and then struck the beast in the head, sending an electrical current through it, causing the creature's head to spasm uncontrollably. After a couple of seconds, he pried the weapon from the beast's head, leaving a charred and smoking wound as it slumped the ground. As they continued to fight, Albright heard a faint scream through the commotion and turned around. He looked up in horror as he saw Snipes fighting off an Arax patroller on the rooftop. He aimed his rifle at the beast, but held off on firing for fear of hitting Snipes by mistake. He waited for an opening, and once Snipes was out of the way, he let loose a three-round burst at the arachnid. All three rounds found their mark, causing the arachnid to stumble and screech in pain, though it quickly recovered and charged Snipes yet again. She managed to fire her rifle at the beast, hitting it square in the face, which resulted in another louder, pained screech. For a moment the fight seemed to be going in her favour, but the arachnid recovered quicker than she could fire off another shot and was upon her. It swiftly clamped its mandibles around her midsection and swung her to the left, releasing her and launching her over the rooftop. Albright could do nothing but watch on in helpless terror as she fell to the ground. 
He then began to rapidly fire at the beast, hitting it several times, causing it to stumble over the edge as well. He watched in pained satisfaction as the abomination hit the ground, its legs curling inwards. He continued to look on at the area where Snipes had landed, but was broken from his entranced state when he heard a nearby scream of pain. He turned and saw a footbat held in the mouth of one of the canines. Blacksmith and Blade ran to help, Blade swiping at the beast's front leg as Blacksmith drove his axe into its side, aiming for the heart. The electric charge jolted its heart to a complete stop, and the creature released Footpat, but the damage was too severe. She was mortally wounded. Samir! Blade shouted as he ran to her, dropping to his knees and supporting her head. Samira coughed up a mouthful of blood before speaking. Keep up the fight, brother. I'll see you. She coughed up more blood and took a gasped breath of air. I'll see you on the other side, she said with a faint smile before closing her eyes for the final time. When he returned to his feet, Blade looked around and noticed the dwindling numbers of the Sotu soldiers. This was a losing battle, and they all knew it. Oh, we need to fall back. There's nothing more we can do here. This battle is lost. Glocksmith reluctantly agreed, as well as Albright and Blacksmith. The battle may be lost, but the war continues, Albright remarked before the four of them began to retreat. They ran through the battlefield, dodging the bodies of the fallen as they made their escape. They ran as hard as they possibly could, but, as they did, they heard separate thuds growing closer and closer. Blade looked back briefly and noticed that two canines, as well as a sphinx, were hot on their tail. <laughs> Run faster, he shouted ahead. The thuds of the abominations were closing in fast, and they knew that they couldn't outrun these enemies. Blade made a split-second decision and stopped running. He swung around and charged the beasts, sword in hand. He dodged the first canine and drew his sword into the beast's heart, but before he could recover his blade, the second canine caught up and slammed the man with his head, knocking him to the ground before descending upon him, ripping him apart. The last three continued to run, Albright at the head, and the two weaponsmiths behind him, side by side. Clocksmith looked at Blacksmith and yelled, We can unrun them, but we can try to kill them. How? Blacksmith shouted in response. Here, take this, Clocksmith said as he handed Blacksmith a small black box. If it works, an electrical current will jump from that box to this one when you press the button, he said, pulling another from his bag. The current should hit the canine and jump to the Sphinx, if we're lucky, he concluded, nearly out of breath. Blacksmith silently agreed, and the two of them spread apart while continuing their full sprint. Once they were positioned correctly, Clocksmith shouted, Now! The two of them stopped abruptly and pressed the buttons on their boxes. As planned, an electrical arc jumped from Blacksmith's box. The two of them jumped abruptly and pressed the buttons on their boxes. As planned, an electrical arc jumped from Blacksmith's box to Clocksmith's. The arc jumped to the canine and stopped it dead in its tracks, the beast sealing violently, but failed to jump onward to the charging sphinx. The Sphinx charged Clocksmith, swiping its paw at the old man, leaving a deep gash across his midsection. He fell to the ground as Blacksmith charged the creature and drove his axe into its side, just barely missing his heart. The wounded creature quickly slapped him away and pounced, grabbing his throat with his mouth, ripping it out in one swift motion. Albright looked behind him as he continued to run, while his last two squad mates perished behind him. He took the opportunity of the final beast being distracted to escape. He faced forward and ran as hard as he could, reaching an old and abandoned building. He turned hard and ran inside. He ran through the building and found a room with no windows and ample furniture. He ran into the room and quickly shut the door behind him. He proceeded to barricade the door with whatever furniture he could find before stopping to take a breather. 
He stood still and closed his eyes, listening to the sound of his pounding heart. After a few seconds of standing there, the sudden sound of something slamming into the door jolted him back to reality. The blows to the door continued, each time breaking down the makeshift barricade more and more. Fuck. Fuck, fuck, he said to himself. Think, Alfred, think. There's always a way, he continued as the beast continued to throw itself against the door. He turned and looked upwards noticing a large and open air duct on the wall. He let out a sigh of relief. But as he did, the beast gave one final blow, shattering the barricade that separated them. And so, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, that story absolutely kicked my ass. Now, there's a famous quote from uh, Harrison Ford when he was uh, reading the dialogue for Star Wars. And he said to uh, George Lucas, Well, you know what? You can write this shit, but there's sure as hell no way you can actually say it. And that was um, pretty much the case with tonight's story. One that I really loved and, and uh, I started reading a few months ago, but it really kicked my ass because... There are certain things you can read uh, from a page, but when you try and read it out loud, it's just not so easy. But I hope you think it was worth it. Well, I will be back again on Sunday. Breach anyone? I think it's about time I return, isn't it? Well, okay then. That's a deal. Till then, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>